there's hope. We've got a blessed hope. Even if all this goes to pot, we've got a blessed hope. That soon and very soon our king is coming back to get us. And one day we are going to be able to spend all eternity with him. What a blessed hope. There will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. What a blessed hope we have. But before even that takes place, because he conquered Satan at Calvary and he conquered that grave, we have hope right here. Right now that our God is able to overcome every situation and circumstance that we are facing right now. What hope we have here today. There's hope. Because He lives, there is hope. Thank you, worship team, for leading us to the throne room of God this morning. There's a powerful presence of God that's in the room here today. I trust and I know that there's a powerful presence of God in your homes right now. And I'm believing that before today is over, we are going to see a mighty outpouring in our homes personally for each and every one of us, whether it's a healing of our bodies or whether it's a financial blessing or whether it's just a prayer or a comfort that you may need here today. I believe that our God is going to hear our cry and I'm looking forward to a tremendous Sunday with each and every one of you in your homes. If you will turn your Bibles in your homes or if you just want to wait for it to come up on your screen. Psalms 37 and 25 is where we will go. I'm going to talk to you this morning on a simple subject, never forsaken. I'm never forsaken and you're never forsaken. Keep Psalms 37 and 25 open in your Bibles right now. You can, you can sit down briefly. Or hopefully if you would like to stand the whole sermon and preach with me, you can do that. You can sit the whole sermon, whatever is most comfortable for you. But I trust on the other end you will help me preach today. I'm expecting God to do mighty things. During this season that we are going through and we are facing, I know that there has to still be fear, concern, worry that many of you are facing. Maybe it's a feeling of loneliness. Maybe you're feeling forgotten. Maybe you were going through something long before this virus took place and caused us to be sheltered in our home. Maybe you were facing something and people were checking on you regularly and people were maybe calling you more often than they are now. I don't know what you're facing. Maybe you were about to get a promotion on your job and now you've been laid off. Maybe you are feeling more lonely and depressed than, than ever and you're scared to death and you don't know what the outcome of all this will be. Maybe you were scheduled to have surgery that was supposed to alleviate major pains in your body but that had to be put on pause and postponed for a later date. Maybe your marriage was about to have a breakthrough and you were going to see your, your counselor on a weekly basis and there was about to be a tremendous breakthrough but even that had to be put on hold and, and now there's uncertainty and unrest maybe even in your marriage. Maybe you were close to finally breaking your addiction but the fear and the anxiety that is associated with this pandemic has maybe sent you running back to the pill bottle or to the scotch bottle. And it feels like maybe you are completely on your own during this season. Though you may have your family that is shut in with you, maybe you feel so alone, forgotten, and forsaken. Left to navigate this ever-changing world on your own. And that brings us to our scripture here today that I told you to turn to or that will pop up on your screen. This scripture is oft quoted and especially during this time and season. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And it's a very famous passage of scripture. It's quoted very often especially during what we are facing right now. I've heard it a ton. But instead of just quoting it to make me feel better, and instead of just quoting it to make you feel better, let's take a moment and look at who's doing the talking. Let's dive into it for just a moment. 
It's the sweet psalmist David that we call him. The man after God's own heart, this is attributed to him writing this text. But there was times in David's life where he really wasn't the sweet psalmist David. There were times where the man after God's own heart, his heart wasn't in the right place. If there was anybody who had an opportunity to feel forsaken, it would have been David. If there was anybody who had the opportunity to feel like God maybe had turned his back on him, David had the opportunity to allow those feelings to come into his life. If there was anybody who had the opportunity for the devil to step in and lie and accuse and convince him that God had turned his back on him, David was a prime candidate. You see... I know we call him the sweet psalmist and also the man after God's own heart. And he is those things. But he's also David the adulterer. He's also David the murderer. He's also David the numberer who rebelled against God and went against God and numbered the people and cost thousands of men their lives. It's David who had a family dynamic that belongs on the Dr. Phil show. A daughter raped by a half-brother who is then murdered by his half-brother. Who then goes on, that half-brother then goes on to successfully raise a coup against his father and overthrow his kingdom for a short time. Only to wind up being murdered after going against the king's orders. He was murdered as his hair is caught in the, in the tree. Absalom, oh Absalom. If after all of that, if after committing adultery, if after murdering, if after having to deal with tremendous family difficulties and trials and situations, if he is able to then say, I was young, now I am old, but I have never, ever once seen a time in my life where God has ever forsaken me and let me down. His grace has always met me. His mercy has always met me. His provision has always met me. His power and His promises have always met me. God will stand by His people. We will not be forsaken during this time and this hour. God is standing with us. He proved it early on that He honors His Word. He had a covenant with Abraham and God had to honor His Word. The Israelites were spared from the plagues and the pandemic that overcame Egypt. Those boils that attacked those people, the frogs, the locusts, the bloody water. The children of Israel were, spared, were spared from having to go through those epidemics and those pandemics. They had to honor the Passover at the last one. But they were spared having to deal with all of those things. And God led them out and got them out of Egypt. He set them free from Egyptian bondage. He destroyed their enemy because He never forsakes us. In the midst of their whining and their complaining after he saw them through the Red Sea and got them to the other side, they begin to whine and complain. What are we going to drink? What are we going to eat? He turned bitter waters sweet. He provided fresh manna daily. And in the midst of their complaints when that wasn't enough, he said, if that's not enough for you, here's quail that I will provide for you. Not only did he provide fresh manna and fresh quail, but he was a cloud to guide them by day and not only to guide them, but to block the heat of the sun. By night to lead and to guide them, he was a pillar of fire, not only to lead, but to give them warmth in the cold air of the desert night. He's always going to be with us. Even though they lacked faith, even though they murmured and complained, and were forced to wander in the desert for 40 long years, their sandals never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. God still stood by them. Even in the midst of their lack of faith, even in the midst of their rebellion, even when they wouldn't subject themselves to the leadership that God had placed in their life, He still stood by them. It got to a place where He got very angry with them, 
and he repented that he had ever brought them out. He was very upset and he said, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to start all over. And Moses looked back at God and said, God, you need to repent for even thinking of that because there's a covenant you made with Abraham. There's a promise you made with Abraham. You've got to stand by them. You've got to bless them. I know they do some things that are aggravating. I know that they rebel. I know that they have a lack of faith. But there's promises that you've made. There's a covenant that you've made. So stand by them, God. And God stood by them. A rock followed them that flowed with water. If he did it for his Old Testament church, if he stood by an Old Testament church that had a lack of faith, that murmured and complained, that wouldn't even subject themselves and honor the authority that was in their life, if he would do it for them, how much more do you think he would stand by his very own pride? I know that we have fear. I know that we have worry. I know that this pandemic is coming against us. I know that you're facing things personally here today that maybe have absolutely nothing to do with this virus. You're just facing something else. And you've got fear, worry, and concern. I'm here to tell you here this morning that our God will never forsake us. He will never leave us. And though we may feel forgotten, we may feel like God's nowhere around, He's working on our behalf. He's standing by us right here, right now. We will never be forsaken. His promises are yea and amen. The Old Testament church, the children of Israel wandering in that desert, they had a wooden box that had been overlaid with gold. It was called the Ark of the covenant or the ark of promises the covenant the promises the contract if you will it was meant to remind the children of Israel that God's presence would always be with them but not only would his presence be with them and not only would he never leave nor forsake them but it was also a reminder that I have a covenant with you the ark of the covenant I have a covenant with you. I have a contract with you. I have promises that I've got to fulfill to you. And inside of that ark that represents my presence, that represents my promises to you, we're going to put a pot of manna in there. And that is meant to remind you that I will sustain you no matter what you are facing and going through. I will provide for you no matter what you are coming up against. There's a law in there to remind you that you belong to me. And you can always rely on my word to see you through. There's Aaron's rod that budded in there that represents the power of Almighty God that is able to bring us out through and around any trial or situation that we may be facing, any crisis that may be coming against us, Aaron's rod that budded is in there to remind us that God has the power to see us through and that He can destroy all of our enemies. That's our God. And just as He did it for our Old Testament church, surely He will do it today for His bride. For we no longer have to rely on a golden box for His presence. We have the opportunity to repent of our sins, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, evidence and speaking in other tongues, which is the literal presence of God living and residing on the inside of this box, this flesh. He resides in me and He can reside in you and resides in you. It's the presence of God living in me and the presence of God living in you. It's that Holy Ghost that lives in us to lead us and to guide us and to keep us. We don't have to rely on a box any longer. We've got Him on the inside of us. We've got the presence of God that lives on the inside of us. We've got manna that lives lives on the inside of us to sustain us. We've got the law that lives on the inside of us to see us through and to abide by and to follow His Word. We've got Aaron's rod that budded that lives on the inside of us to carry us through this trial, through this storm, through this situation. God is with us and fighting for us and He lives in me, He lives in you. And if He doesn't, you have a tremendous opportunity today to repent
repent of your sins, to be baptized in His name, and to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'll say it again at the end of my message, but you can contact us. You can message us on Facebook, and you can try to get a hold of us, and we will hear you, and we would love to pray with you. We would love to baptize you. We would love to pray for the repentance of sin in your life, and we would love to see the gift of the Holy Ghost enter inside of you. That's the power of God, the presence of God that can live inside of you, and it's your manna, it's your law, it's the rod that budded to give you power and authority over every situation in your life. You see, God has a covenant with us. He lives with us. The Ark of the Covenant, the covenant, the promises that He has, just as He had with Abraham, that law and that promise and that covenant is still resounding here today. And He's got promises and covenants that He has to fulfill, just as He did for the Old Testament church. He's doing it for us. Like the promise of healing. Most people here, or most people watching, In our society, we accept disease and death as normal parts of our life. And it is, but that was never God's original intent. When the world was first created, God saw everything and everything was good. There wasn't death, there wasn't sickness, there wasn't disease, there wasn't viruses. There wasn't financial struggles. There wasn't marital troubles. There there wasn't lost kids. There wasn't difficult things. God saw everything and it was good. But because of what had taken place in sin with Adam and Eve, it, it allowed sin to enter into the world. And satanic bondage gripped society, gripped humankind, put a foothold in humankind. And so when Jesus came to earth, that's why he announced that God's kingdom was at hand. And what he is meaning is how it was before. God's kingdom, the way it was intended, is at hand. We are very close to being able to go back to like it was originally intended. God's kingdom is at hand. And one day, the the fulfillment of God's kingdom will take place. And there will be no more sorrow, death, sickness, pain, or death. But for now, we are dealing with sickness, disease, and death. But there was a glimpse given to us of what it was like before that took place and what it will be like in the future. He came preaching and announcing that God's kingdom is at hand. And what did he do with that? He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He fed the multitude. He raised the dead. This was all a demonstration of the blessings of God and what he originally intended to be and what is to come. It's a little taste of what's coming. Healing and deliverance and salvation. God's kingdom is at hand. So here's what I want to tell you here today. The healing power of Almighty God is still alive and well in today's world just as it was 2,000 years ago. His kingdom is still at hand. He still wants to give us a little taste of what's to come. So I believe in the name of Jesus right now that healing can come to anybody that is watching on that screen, you have sickness in your body, you have an ailment in your body, you have coronavirus in your body, you've got cancer in your body, you've got something that's coming against you physically, we bind that in the name of Jesus and we claim healing in your life in Jesus' name. Because the kingdom of God is at hand, we are going to see healing take place in Jesus' name. I claim it and I believe that in Jesus' name. Speak it here today. When he preached the gospel, when he preached the gospel of the kingdom, it goes on to say that he healed all manners of sickness and disease. He can do it. So no matter what your disease is, no matter what you're facing, Jesus can be our healer today. I believe it for me and I believe it for you. You accept it right now in the name of Jesus. I wish everybody was here. We could end service right now and go lay hands on everybody. And we would speak healing, but we can't do that right now. So in the name of Jesus, we speak healing across this screen to people's bodies in Jesus' name. 
It's a promise that we have. I'll read them to you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. This is Psalms 103, 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. That's a promise from Almighty God. Prophecy in Isaiah 53 and 5. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. It's promises. It's a covenant that He's made with us. It's that ark of the covenant. A promise that He's making with us that He will heal us. James 5, 14, 15. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him. Anoint them with oil. Call on the name of the Lord. Pray a prayer of faith and we will see the sick raised up. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Mark 16, 17 and 18. These signs shall follow them that believe they will lay hands on the sick they shall recover uh, John 3 uh, or 3 John 1 and 2 beloved I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers Matthew 9 and 35 Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom healing Every sickness and every disease among the people. Luke 6 and 19. The whole multitude sought to touch him because power and virtue was going out of him. And he healed them all. If Jesus did that then, let me give you a powerful scripture. If he healed all then. It's a very simple scripture that we all know very well. It's Hebrews 13 and 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday today and forever. If 2,000 years ago virtue went out of him and all were healed, then right here, right now, in 2020, Jesus Christ, virtue can go out. It's a promise. Virtue can go out of him right now and he can heal any manner of sickness and disease. It's a promise and I claim it for you in Jesus' name. My God can heal you. He's never going to forsake us. Never going to leave us. My God can heal us in our sickness and our disease. Maybe it's not sickness you're battling. Maybe you've been laid off. Maybe your hours have been cut. And you're saying, how am I going to sustain? How am I going to provide for my family? How, How am I going to get through this? Well, let me tell you. There's a pot of manna living on the inside of you that's going to sustain you. There's a promise of provision. Psalms 81 and 10. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. Psalms 34, 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want for any good thing. Well, that's the Old Testament, gent. What about the New Testament? Glad you asked. Philippians 4, 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Matthew 6 and 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, or you not much better than they. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Second Peter 1 and 3. According to his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and, go- and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. My God is able to heal. My God is able to sustain. It reminds me, speaking of healing, it reminds me of stories that I've heard, healing and provision. I remember Papa telling a story about his sister Ruth. He would always say, and and I wish Jonathan Dean was here. I'd have him come up and mimic Papa. He can sound just like him. He would say, I remember in Plymouth, Indiana, we owned a peppermint farm. My dad had a peppermint farm. I'm talking as Papa was talking. My dad's right here. But he said, my dad had a peppermint farm. And I remember my sister Ruth became ill with diphtheria. She had a fever. She was about to die. She was on her deathbed. And there was a 
lady healer and a lady prophet by the name of Manny Crawford. And she was holding a tent revival not far from our house. And we threw Ruth in the back seat of our car. We made our way to that tent revival. And when we got there, this lady didn't know they were coming, didn't know when they would arrive. There wasn't no cell phones to let them know what time they'd be there. They said when they pulled up, she was already walking to the car, waving a white handkerchief saying, you've drove all this way. She's healed. She's healed. Papa's favorite part of the story that he would tell is he looked back at her and he said, she's healed my foot. She's dead. She's dead. I'm sitting right here by her. She's going to die. No longer had he said that. They looked, that fever had broken. She was already on the mend. And that disease that had attacked her had been cast out of her completely. My God still heals. My God still sustains. I remember Greg Albritton and I remember Pastor when we drove through Baton Rouge coming home from our family vacation that summer. He was scheduled for surgery the next day having to fuse his neck back together. And at this time, it was a, an exploratory surgery. It wasn't as advanced as it is today where they have to go through the neck to heal the, or had to go through the throat to heal the neck. Very scared of what is to come, having to go under the knife, not knowing exactly what is to come. And pastor said, Jen, if you'll pray for him, I believe God will heal him. Not knowing any better, having the faith of the child lay hands on Greg, ask God to heal Greg, only for the next day to finally come. And they say, before we go do this surgery, let's do one more round of x-rays. They take him in, and that neck had fused together on its own, not having to have surgery. And Greg is still mobile today. His neck still works today because my God still heals. You mentioned just the other day, and I, I can still remember it, you mentioned that lady from Russia who was deaf, who was healed back there. But I, I'm not, I, I know you talked about that, but I want to talk about my own personal experience. I remember her coming to the front. And I remember her, her face and I remember she was trembling and shaking and tears flowing down her eyes, holding her ears and shaking under the power of God because my God still heals. My God still provides. My God still sustains. I remember the story that Lane's oldest sister would tell Aunt Nona about Popsy Gibson and about that cow. That cow that they had, it's what sustained them. It's what saw them through. It's what gave them milk to drink. It's how they were able to be sustained. And it's how they were able to feed themselves and drink. And that cow got sick. And that cow was about to die. And Aunt Nona would tell the story of how Popsy Gibson went out there and laid hands on that cow and said, God, this is the cow that sustains us. This is what is going to see us through. We can't make it without this cow. We'll have nothing to drink. And we don't have the money to afford milk. This is what's going to See us through, God. I need you to heal this cow in Jesus' name. You may think it's funny. You may think it's crazy. But that cow was healed. And it sustained them. And it fed that family and saw them through. My God can still do those things. If he's able to do it 2,000 years ago. If he's able to do it in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. If he's able to see people through great depressions. If he's able to see people through world wars then my God is able to see us through this time and this uncertainty that we're facing, this situation and circumstances that's coming against you. My God will never forsake me and He'll never forsake you. Healing is on its way in Jesus' name. Sustenance is on its way in Jesus' name. My God will provide for me and my God will provide for you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Claim it right now. Claim it right now. Take a moment and claim it right now. Join hands with your loved ones and claim it in the name of Jesus. Greater than all of that. Greater than healing. Greater than power, provision, sustenance. We have the promise of salvation. Isaiah 1 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What a promise of salvation that is to come. 
Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace you are saved through faith. Not of yourself. It's the gift of God. It's the promise that God has for each and every one of us. That salvation is for each and every one of us. 2 Corinthians 5 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we... We, no good, no bodies who are unrighteous. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. We have the promise of salvation. So no matter how bad it gets, no matter how difficult it may be, if He doesn't heal me, if He doesn't sustain me, if He doesn't provide for me, I have the opportunity to do what Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 tells me to do. Repent of my sins, be baptized in His name and be filled with His Spirit. And by His grace, I am saved. And I know that I have a blessed hope. If I don't see it through this life, if I don't see the blessings in this life, if He doesn't provide for me in this life, which I believe He is, if He doesn't heal me in this life, which I believe He is and He will, if He doesn't see me through here, I've got the promise of salvation that one day I'm going to be able to leave this whole earth and spend all eternity with Him. And though I was ugly, though I was unrighteous, though I was dirty, I have the opportunity to be white as wool. There may be those of you who have family members that aren't saved. I want to give you some belief here today. That's a promise of God to each and every one of us. Those promises of salvation that I just read aren't just for me and aren't just for you. They're for every single human being on planet earth. And I want to give you hope here today about your lost loved ones and friends that you've been working on that our God isn't going to give up on them. So we shouldn't either. Revelation 3 and 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. We have that promise that God is continually knocking, just waiting on somebody. One day, you keep praying for your neighbor. Keep praying for your lost loved ones. Keep praying maybe for your, your kids or your brother or your sister, your mom, your dad, your aunts, your uncles, that they too will one day accept the promise of salvation in their life because Jesus is just standing at the door knocking, waiting for them to open the door. He's never leaving. He's never going to forsake them. He's just going to keep on knocking until they're ready. And you keep praying and keep believing for those individuals because God is ready and when they're ready, we're going to see God do a great work in our family members' lives, in our prodigals' lives, in our lost loved ones' lives. He will never, ever forsake us. If you want to come to the music, I'm coming to a close. If, y'all want to, if the singers would come join me. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And though the grass may wither, the flower may fade, this word is going to stand forever. He's got a covenant that He's got to keep with each and every one of us. He's got promises that He's guaranteed us. Promises like John 14 tell us that if we ask anything in His name, He will do it for His glory. What a promise. There's promises that He's given us. His promises are yea and amen, and He's going to see us through this season of our lives. And if you'll stand in your home, and those that are with us here, Pastor, if you'll stand, and as our, our music team comes, I want to read you a portion of Scripture that Sister Mangan pointed out to me. She was on fire Wednesday night, giving us tons of information on all those vows and seals. But the close of the seventh seal is at the end of Revelation chapter 11 and 19. talking about future events that are to come, future difficulties and and wrath and anger that God is going to pour out. But look at this scripture and what what a promise. And it ties everything back together. Revelation 11 and 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in His temple the ark of His testament, which is the ark of the covenant. The ark of His promise. The ark of the contract that He's got with all of us. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. That's representing the presence of God. 
That's God's presence that's surrounding that Ark of the Covenant. Voices, thunderings, lightnings, earthquake, and great hail. So I'm not going to take this scripture out of context. That's God's presence. But in the midst of all of that, and in the midst of that seventh seal coming to a close, God wanted to remind us that the Ark of the Promise is still seen. That there are still promises that He's going to hold on to. Even until the end of the world, even until the end of the age, God's got promises and God's got a covenant that He's going to stand by. I believe, and if you want to argue with me, that's fine. You may have your own belief, and it's just what I've been taught. That's what I choose to believe. If you can debate it with somebody else. I'm not going to debate it with you because we really don't have the answer. But I choose to believe that the Ark of the Covenant right now is in heaven. I believe it was raptured. That's what I choose to believe. You may believe differently. I like to believe it's raptured because I think Jesus Christ took the blood and placed it on the mercy seat, giving us all a chance at redemption. You can believe differently, and that's fine. I choose to believe that it's in heaven. So right now, in the midst of, and I know that's representing God's presence, but in the physical, we deal with earthquakes and thunderings and lightnings and hailstorms and hurricanes that come against us and viruses that come against us and cancer that comes against us and financial difficulties that come against us and struggles in our home and struggles in our marriages and struggles with our kids. And life in general can be difficult. Thunderings, lightnings, hailstorms, difficulties, pandemics. In the midst of all of that, I want to remind you that there's an Ark of the Covenant. There's an Ark of Promise that reminds each and every one of us that not only is the presence of God with us, we're never forsaken, but the promises of God are with us. We've got manna that will sustain us through this. We've got the Word of God that will sustain us through this. We've got Aaron's rod that has budded, that gives us power through all of this. We've got the promise of healing, the promise of provision, the promise of his power, and the promise of salvation. So in the name of Jesus, as we're all standing together, why don't you join with your loved one? Why don't you lay hands on your loved one? I know that we're in the midst of self-quarantine, but in the name of Jesus, why don't you join your family and speak healing over them? Speak provision over them. Speak salvation over them. If there's somebody in your home that hasn't repented of their sins, hasn't been baptized in Jesus' name, hasn't received the gift of the Holy Ghost, you can lay hands on them right now. And in the name of Jesus, they can receive it right now. Speak it over them in Jesus' name. I pray healing into your body. I pray provision into your family. I speak healing, provision, and I speak salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray over one another. Speak it over one another. In the name of Jesus Christ, let it be done today. He'll never forsake us. when that centurion came in they were standing here on these steps and he told the Lord my daughter's sick would you come pray for her and he was going to lead in the centurion with his faith he said you don't even have to go if you'll just speak the word it shall be done now God's going to do some great things we baptized four here Friday night We've got two to baptize this afternoon. We've had revival this week. I'm thankful for it. 
But I'm going to do something that some people, that's why I want you to step here, would think foolish. That's my oil right there that I keep with me. It's like American Express. I don't leave home without it. I want you to take that oil and that camera that's on, Jason, if you don't mind, leave that on. That camera that's on right there, I want you to go anoint that lens. And I want you to anoint that lens and we'll, we'll clean it up later. But I want everybody to know that oil is being anointed on them today. We're going to anoint you in Jesus' name. And when we do, healing is going to happen. Salvation is going to happen. That's it, Pastor Gentry. Put the oil on that camera right there. Put it on the lens. In the name of Jesus and through the authority and the power of your name, we have anointed with oil now, Lord. Do the work. In the name of our great God. Gentry, anoint the other one too. There you go. In Jesus' name. To those that are watching, we anoint it. You're anointed through the power and the unction of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, we speak it by faith, God. We accept your healing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and your power. I know today.